the Apostle Paul left the city of Athens and he entered the city of Corinth, the great city of Corinth, and he entered that city alone. And he had challenges and great challenges before him. But I think it would be safe to say that Paul was not unfamiliar with challenges. As we've studied through the book of Acts, we've seen a number of challenges that he faced. Let's just review a few of them. When he encountered Christ in Acts chapter 9, then he was blinded for three days. And then after that, he preached the gospel in Damascus, and he had an assassination plot against him, and so he had to be lowered over the city walls in a basket and flee Damascus because he preached Christ. Then he went to Jerusalem, and he preached Christ in Jerusalem, and there was another assassination plot against him, so he had to be a ship, put on a ship and sent to Tarsus and flee because of that. And then when he was in Perga, he was deserted by John Mark. And then when he went to Pisidian Antioch, he was driven out of the city there. And then he went to Iconium, and he had to flee there because they were going to stone him in that city. And then he went to Lystra, and he was stoned and left for dead in the city of Lystra. And then he had a sharp disagreement with Barnabas over John Mark, and so they parted company, another challenge that he faced. And then he went to Philippi, and he was beaten with rods in the city of Philippi. And then he went to Thessalonica, and he was forced to flee the city at night. And then he went to Berea, and he was forced to flee the city by sea to evade his pursuers. And then he went to Athens and he was insulted and mocked there. And we could go on and on and on, but I think it would be safe to say that the Apostle Paul was not unfamiliar with challenges. And so now he comes to the great city of Corinth, which would have been 50 miles due west of the city of Athens. Now, Corinth really was a great city in the ancient world. If you look at it in numbers, it probably had about 600,000 people. It was a city that was located right on the isthmus between the Peloponnese and Attica or northern Greece. And so really it was a land bridge between the south and between the north. And so if you wanted to go north or south, you had to go through Corinth. But also it was on an isthmus four miles wide between the Aegean Sea and the Adriatic Sea. And so if you wanted to go from east to west, you had to go through the city of Corinth because sailors didn't want to go around the southern tip of Greece because it was so dangerous. So they would bring their ships to Corinth. And if it was a large ship, they would unload on one side and then they would take their goods to a ship on the other side. If it was a smaller ship, they had a mechanism where they could even roll the ship over that four-mile isthmus. And so really, it was the commercial center of Greece. If you think about it, maybe somebody said if you were in England, it'd be like going from Athens, the intellectual center, to London, the commercial center. Or maybe in the United States, I don't know, maybe going from Boston to New York. Or if you're in Illinois, probably going from Springfield, the intellectual center, to Chicago, the commercial center. I'm not sure about that, but, you know, we'll, we'll try it. Uh, but anyway, it was a great commercial center there in Greece. Um, it had a reputation, though, for immorality. If Athens was full of idolatry, Corinth was full of immorality. It had certainly pagan gods. It had the temple of Epaphrodite, uh, the goddess of love, and it was seated on a mountain above the city, and every night a thousand prostitutes would come down into the city. It hosted the temple of Apollo, who was the god of wine and fine, spirit, fine arts, and, and that temple, I think, had 36, 24-foot columns that were covered with gold. So if you were approaching from the west and you could see the sun from the sea, even you could see the gold of the temple there. Uh, the word Corinthianize was coined to refer to those who were drunks and were involved in sexual immorality because the city was known for that. So it might be comparing it to a modern city, you know, a seedier side of maybe a Las Vegas or I don't know. I, you get the idea. Corinth was a, a challenging place. And the Apostle Paul came to this city, and we would say that he came alone. What would he do there? What would he do? And he, he had left 
uh, Luke, probably in Philippi, to watch out for the church there. He had left Silas and Timothy in Macedonia, and then was it, I think, Timothy would go to Philippi to watch out and make sure that the churches were doing well. So from what we know, he went to the city of Corinth alone. And it was a great city. It was a large city. It had all these things going on, and I think it would have been quite a challenge, to say the least. And could he be discouraged? Was he discouraged? Was he afraid? I think it's very possible that he was. As a matter of fact, we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 about what he did when he got to Corinth. He said, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So what did he do when he got to Corinth? He did what he did in every city. He preached the gospel. He continued on. He pressed on and he presented the gospel of Christ. But notice what he says. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So he was there in fear and trembling. In other words, was he afraid? Well, he says he was afraid. He says he had fear and trembling, and yet notice how he continues to preach the gospel. And then he goes on, in my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words and wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So what did Paul do when he got to Corinth? He did what he always did. He preached the gospel. And so there we pick up in Acts chapter 18. So let's look in verse 1. It says, After these things he left Athens, and he went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Achilla, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so what I think we're going to see here in the passage and and what I want you to see is it looks to me like God is superintending and God is providentially encouraging and helping and providing people for the Apostle Paul in spite of the great difficulties that he met and faced because he goes there and it looks to me like he goes alone and yet what do we find out? Right away he meets this man, Achilla. Now Luke introduces us to him. He will be a little more well known as the book of Acts continues on in his wife Priscilla and they became leaders in the early church. Now it says here we, he was a Jew. So had he become a Christian yet or did Paul lead him to Christ here in Corinth? We don't know, but it does seem that he was a faithful and reliable friend to the Apostle Paul. So it says he met this man named Achilla. It says he came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. So the Apostle Paul had a secular job. He had a skill. He had a trade. He was able to make a living that way. It says he was a tent maker. Now, it could also mean he was a leather worker. Some think that leather in tents, maybe that's how they made that particular tent. But either way, he was a co-worker with Achilla and Priscilla, or at least Achilla, and, and and they became fast friends. And I think God upheld and encouraged him through that friendship. And perhaps Paul led him to Christ there, or maybe he had become a Christian in Rome, and then he continued uh, in, and went to Corinth. So he came there, and they were tent makers. And then in verse 4 it says, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. So Paul would go to the synagogue. That was his pattern in every city. It said he would go to the Jew first and also to the Greek. As he says in another place, and so having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light 
both to the Jewish people and also to the Gentiles. In other words, he would reason and says, say, Jesus is the Christ. And he would say, the Christ, the Bible says in the Old Testament, has to suffer. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture says the Christ would be raised from the dead, and he would be the one who would proclaim the light, the light to the end of the earth, to the Jewish people first, and also to the Gentiles. And that's what he would say. And that's what he said in the city of Corinth. And so he went there, he proclaimed Christ, he sought to persuade Jews and Greeks. And it says, but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Now, I think he was encouraged by Achilla, but now I think he's encouraged that Silas and Timothy have come back. In other words, he was alone when he got there, but he met Achilla. And now Silas and Timothy have come back. And as we read in another place in 2 Corinthians, he was encouraged because when they came back, they also brought a gift from the church in Philippi. And I think that gift enabled Paul not to have to work then in a secular job. He was devoting himself completely to the ministry of the word. He was encouraged by that. But he was also encouraged by their well uh, that they were in good condition, that they were okay, their well-being, because he was concerned about their well-being because he was separated from that. And so then he continues on. And then it says, but when they resisted, verse 6, the Jews, the Jewish leaders of the synagogue, he shook out his garments. In other words, that was a sign to disassociate himself with them. Because in other words, what he's saying is, you've had an opportunity. You've heard the message. You've rejected the message. So now that separation is occurring. He shook out, his, in a sense, the dust from his garments to symbolize that he had no responsibility for them from that point on and that they had rejected the word of God. He shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be upon or on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he came to Corinth. He came to this great city and he kept on going. He went to the synagogue. He presented the message. They resisted. He kept on going. And so now it says he will go to the Gentiles. In verse 7, then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. So we see another now, another person he meets that God seems to bring these people along to him. And there's a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. And, and that would indicate that he was a, a believing man. He was a God-fearing man, probably a Greek, but had been connected to the synagogue. He believes. And so Paul goes to his house. Now, not to live there, but it seems that Paul then would teach and preach in the house of Titius Justus. And it seems like it must have been right next door to the synagogue. What a coincidence. Imagine that. Doesn't it seem like God is working in the life of the Apostle Paul? And then what do we read in the next verse? And it says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians were, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And so now there's another man, and not just any man. He just happens to be Crispus, the leader of the synagogue. So even though, even though the synagogue as a whole had rejected the message and Paul had to leave, people in the synagogue, many of them believed. And so he sets up, we could say, shop in the home of Titius Justice. And then it seems now Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believes with his whole household. And many Jews, or well, it says many Greeks, Corinthians, were believing and being baptized. We can read about, some people think this man, Titius Justus, that was, it was his last name, that Gaius was his first name, because he's mentioned with Crispus in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul did not normally baptize people who believed. He had others that would do that, but it does say he baptized those two men. And so, again, it seems that he's being encouraged in spite of the challenges that he faces. And even though he had a pretty modest result in Athens, it seems that he's gone down to Corinth, this capital of immorality, and it seems like he gets a great response. 
And then it says in verse 9, And the Lord said to Paul in a vision, The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision. Now this to me is really interesting. This is interesting timing. Because he's already come to Corinth. He's already faced the great challenge of going to the synagogue and being rejected and then going to the Gentiles. He's already faced the challenge and now the Lord encourages him. And I stop and think, wouldn't it have been better if the Lord had encouraged him and appeared to him first, beforehand? And of course, anytime you and I think, wouldn't it have been better? It wouldn't have been better. God's got a plan. And I think here, God is working through Paul. And Paul is showing perseverance and faith and continuing on in spite of all the difficulties and all the challenges. And then, as he was faithful, then it says the Lord appears to him. And what does he say? He says, do not be afraid any longer. Now, there's two imperatives that he says to him. And imperatives are usually important things to look for. The first thing he says is, don't be afraid. Now, if he says, don't be afraid, what does that mean? It probably means he was afraid. Is it possible for apostles to be afraid? Evidently so. He says, do not be afraid any longer. If it's possible for apostles to be afraid, is it ever possible for you or I to be afraid? You better believe it. It is possible. It's part of the human condition. And yet he says, do not be afraid any longer. And then the second imperative, I think, is the key to the whole passage. He says to him, go on speaking. Go on speaking. What did God call the Apostle Paul to do? He called him to proclaim and to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what had Paul done in every place? He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ and he gets beaten with rods and he receives 39 lashes five times and he flees for his life innumerable times and he's stoned and left for dead. And what does he do? He goes on speaking. Do not be afraid any longer. Go on speaking and do not be silent. In other words, God was encouraging him, I think, to continue to be a witness And that's really the main idea in the whole book of Acts. Remember the theme verses, chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And Paul's being a witness. And God wants you and I to be witnesses as well. And he says, do not be afraid, but go on speaking. And speaking is so important because speaking is where people hear the word of God. And then he says in verse 10, for I am with you. I'm with you. Now we've been saying that Paul went to Corinth alone. But this passage, I think, says, no, he didn't really go alone. It just looked like he was alone. But the Lord says, I'm with you. The Lord had always been with him. So he really didn't go alone because the Lord was with him. And not only was the Lord with him, it seems like the Lord brings people along to help him too. He brings Achilla along and he brings Priscilla along and Titus and Silas come along or Timothy and Silas come along. And then what do we see? Uh, Titius Justus comes along and then Crispus comes along. And so God is encouraging him. I am with you. And he says, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. And I think that was a real concern. I think it's possible we can read through the book of Acts and kind of get the idea, you know what? Paul is used to getting beaten all the time. It's not that big a deal. (laughs) I don't think so. Do you get used to being stoned? Do you get used to being beaten with rods? Do you get used to being receiving 39 lashes five times. I don't think you get used to it. And I don't think you like it, even if you're an apostle. 
And so here he's encouraging him, and he says that no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Now, when he says he has many people in the city too, commentators say, well, what does that mean? Does it mean that he has people in high authority that will protect him? And it could mean that. But I don't think it means that. I think back in chapter 13, verse 48, it says, And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And so what I think it means here, if you want to use a good biblical term, elect, what he's saying to Paul is, there are a lot of elect people out there and keep on speaking because you're going to have a harvest in Corinth. You're going to have a lot of sheep that are going to come into the fold in Corinth. So keep on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you, because I have many people in this city. And so what do we read in the next verse? And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And this was unusual for him, because he wouldn't stay in a city like this for this long ordinarily. This, I think, was the second longest stay. He stayed in Ephesus, I think, a little longer, but this was close. And he stayed there 18 18 months and preached the gospel. And he, I would think, had great success. And that was part of the reason why he stayed there. It's ironic to listen the way the Apostle Paul thinks. And he says in 1 Corinthians 16, For a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. (laughs) <laughs> so he, he sees adversaries, doesn't mean that there's not a wide door for effective service. And so he stays there for 18 months. Now let's see what happens next. But while Gallio was pro council of Achaia, and again, Gallio is a figure that he was the half-brother of a writer named Seneca, and he was said to be of all more. He, w- he says, no one of mortals is so pleasant to one person as he is to all. That this man, Gallio, a person that we can see in secular history written by, about by his half-brother Seneca was the proconsul of Achaia. And it says, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. You know, I could see Paul thinking, you know, here we go again. Uh, but he had that specific promise here, though. And what happens? They And you you have to think they were upset because he'd been successful in the city and not just among the Greeks, but remember Crispus was the leader of the synagogue and he has become a believer in Jesus. That would be upsetting. And so they rose up with one accord and they brought him before the judgment seat and that word is bema. Sometimes you hear that word bema. That's the word there. Saying, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, actually, the Romans considered Christianity to be uh, a part of Judaism. And Judaism was an accepted religion, so Christians would be okay. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or of a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names in your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. So it looks like God has brought Paul another friend, doesn't it? Not that Gallio was really concerned about Paul, but he wasn't concerned about this complaint. And he was a judge that says, I'm not interested. This is a a, a law, uh, a problem, a dispute within your own religion. I have no concern or interest in this affair. And then it says, and he drove them away from the judgment seat. And then it says, and they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue. Apparently, a new leader had taken that position and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. So you'd have to say that no man harmed Paul in Corinth. And God turned actually the tables on them. And Sosthenes himself was beaten and nobody cared. Who knows, there was a man named Sosthenes that Paul refers to later that became a believer. Some say, was this the same man? Maybe this beating helped him to come to faith. I don't know. More than one person could have that name. But either way, it is interesting to note that. 
But what do we see? I think we see that the Apostle Paul continued on. I think there's a a note in the record of the journal of Christopher Columbus one day where Columbus said, today we sailed on. You can't see the land behind and you can't see the land ahead, but you continue to sail on. And the Apostle Paul, he continues to sail on. He continues to go forward. He goes forward even, I think, when he was afraid. He continues to go forward when I think he was discouraged. He says in another place, God comforts the depressed, and God comforted him. You mean apostles can be depressed? Well, it sounds like Paul was at times. Paul was afraid at times, and yet he continues on, and he perseveres, and he's steadfast, and he continues to speak. And sometimes the Lord appeared to him, and there are other times where it doesn't seem like the Lord appeared to him until he'd already gone through the challenge and the trial. But he continues on. What's his secret? Well, I think he pulls back the curtain in his own soul a little bit in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. And he says, having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Why did he speak? Because he believed the gospel. Why should you speak? Because you believe the gospel. That's why he spoke. And he kept on sailing. Was there another source of his strength? I think there was another source of his strength. Because again, we've said that he went to Corinth alone. But did he really go to Corinth alone? Well, in Isaiah 41 verse 10, it says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He wasn't alone. In Isaiah 43, listen to what it says there. Thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Paul wasn't alone because God was with him. And you say, boy, that's great. That apostle Paul, God was with him. But you know, it says in the book of Hebrews, to every Christian, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And at the very end of the Great Commission, it says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. If you've trusted in Christ, God is with you. If you're afraid, sometimes that's okay. If you're depressed, sometimes that's okay. God is with you. And reckon these things to be true and go on speaking. Paul says, I believed, therefore I spoke. Jesus said to him, do not be afraid any longer. Go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and I have many people in this city. So I want to encourage you today, if you're discouraged, if you feel alone, that doesn't mean you're alone because God is with you. And if you have faith, and faith comes from reading the Word and the Word of Christ, then that's the cause or the motivation for us to do or to live or to act the Christian life. So Corinth was a great city, and it had great challenges. But I'd say Jesus Christ was a greater Savior. And you might feel alone and you might have great challenges. But I would say Jesus Christ is a greater Savior. So what does he say to us, I think, today? Go on speaking. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you for your word. And may we be encouraged because certainly there are times we feel depressed, times we feel afraid, times we feel alone. But we're not alone if we trusted in Christ and give us the grace to reckon your word to be true and give us the grace to go on speaking. And if there's someone here who's never trusted in Christ and does not have an assurance of forgiveness, my friend, I ask you to trust in him and you can have that forgiveness today and pray with me. Dear God, there's nothing I can do to bring about my forgiveness, but I believe that Jesus Christ did everything to bring about my forgiveness on the cross. I believe he died in my place and he paid my penalty and I trust in him as my savior. I don't trust in what I've done, I trust in what he did. And I receive the free gift of eternal life because I believe in Jesus Christ, God the Son, and I believe in his cross where my sins were paid for, and I trust in him. In his name we pray, and God, I pray you would encourage your people. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.